Good morning. It's so great to see everyone here on a Saturday morning to support math education in Northern Nevada. Um, those of you who know me know three things. You know that I am super excited about today. <laughs> you know that I fully believe in the power of the common core. And you also know that I'm obsessed with the Zimba chart. <laughs> So I want to talk about two of those things. So in the past, I've seen some things that were troubling. I spent two days with elementary school principals in a training on leading mathematics. During the second day, one of those principals cried because of her own mathematic confidence level. She was terrified of those two days. She loved the class that they were taking, but really wanted to call in sick on the math days. There was a parent who noticed her third grader rushing through his homework problems. He had a whole list of word problems to complete. She started watching and knowing he's good at math, and she realized he wasn't reading the problems. Because, Mom, we're doing division, so you just find the big numbers, and you divide by the small. Last year I was doing a training with elementary teachers, third and fourth grade teachers. We had just had an amazing discussion on their number talks in their classroom and how well they were going. They got an email during that training that said we won't be doing number talks for the next four weeks. This is from their principal. We will be doing test prep instead. But now, this year, here's what I'm seeing. I heard a second grader tell her teacher that when you add 29 plus 49, you have to start with the 49 because that's the most efficient way to do it. <laughs> I heard a teacher say in front of his staff, I'm not totally sure I understand why you invert and multiply, but let me try to explain what I've learned in the progression documents about it. I witnessed a very lively discussion at Silver Lake Elementary School about the traditional algorithm for subtraction. <laughs> and those teachers got out their standards and they used evidence from the text to make their argument, which I hear is an important thing to do. <laughs> I heard a story about a fourth grader whose mother was trying to help her child with homework and she said to him, I'm just not very good at math. And he said, that's okay, Mom. I can teach you. Because anybody can learn math as long as you work at it. So that's where we are now. Here's this chart. This chart that is kind of overwhelming to look at but is so powerful and I thought it would be appropriate to share with Dr. Zimba the ways it's used in Northern Nevada. I started out using it by thinking, well, what happens if this standard isn't learned by a student? That's a kindergarten standard. Foundation for place value. So in first grade, all of those standards are affected. So that first grade teacher is going to have to really struggle to fill that hole that is doable. But by second grade, we're in trouble, right? Second grade, place value. If we're all doing our part, if we're focused, and we believe in the coherence of the plan, we can do this. Sarah used, used this chart to design a fifth grade fraction unit because she wanted to stay in fifth grade standards while still filling in the gaps that her students might have. Kelly used it to trace a sixth grade standard with a group of K6 teachers so that they would understand exactly what part they played in this sixth grade standard. Implementation specialists often use it to demonstrate why we need to focus. Coaches use it to show the coherence of this plan. <coughs> Principals use it when they're having vertical discussions in their, in their schools. And we use it in our office when we're planning our trainings and thinking about the standards and how they're conducted. <coughs> Smithridge first grade teachers used it to develop their uh, unit and grouping standards and figuring out which standards would be 
more appropriate to teach before some of the others. So for late teachers used it to plan interventions and assessments for their tier two and tier three students. So pulpit teachers used it to identify unfinished learning. Our teachers in Minden used it just like the rest of us to see the big picture of what the common core offers. So thank you, Dr. Zimba, for giving us that chance. Okay, is that good? Great. Well, it's great to be here, um, uh, and I thank uh, Northern Nevada Math Council as well as um, all the folks that are, I work with at the uh, Department of Education. And um, you know, at Student Achievement Partners, uh, which is an organization that I can, I'll t be telling you about a little later, we work a lot with Washoe County teachers, and it's great to see that relationship developing and developing further in mathematics today. We, uh, you know, I feel, I feel I know all of you because it, back at SAP at the home office in New York City, Washoe County is always uh, in our discussions and in the air and uh, we have a great time working with you guys and it's a, a real pleasure and an honor for me to be here today. The, um, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> some things you may have heard about, <laughs> focus, coherence and rigor. And I'm going to talk a little bit about where the standards came from and what they require, and then I'm going to show some of the tools or talk about some of the tools that are available. And um, I'm also going to talk about some of the nitty-gritty challenges of implementing these things. Everything is harder than it sounds, and no one knows that better than you all. So um, if there's a little time also for a discussion or you know, throughout the day discussion, uh, that would be great too. So as I say, how the standards were developed, what it will take, three shifts, uh, which you've heard of, and then the discussion, the pr more practical discussion, tools and Q&A about what it takes to bring it to life. How the standards were developed, well the standards movement has a long history, standards have a long history, the Common Core, um, we can go back to 2007, 
a meeting of uh, state superintendents. <clears throat> One of the state chiefs was in the, in the midst of doing a standards revision and said, you know, why are we all doing this individually? Why don't we work together on this? And um, it was just an idea then. By 2009, um, the National Governors Association had become involved and a memorandum of understanding, a memorandum of agreement went out to um, state chiefs and state governors that they would work in common on uh, standards for mathematics and literacy. And <clears throat> in June of that year, 2009, standards writing began and that was a, uh, aimed toward a document of college and career readiness standards. Many drafts and revisions were put out with the states. There was uh, a public draft was put out in September 2009. And at that time also, a process of back mapping and beginning with um, kindergarten began. The old committees were disbanded. New committees and working groups were put together. I'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, states were the clients for that project. Drafts went out periodically to the states. We got reams of feedback from uh, the states on many drafts as well as others I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. By March 2010, public comment draft was released. Uh, we got over 10,000 public comments and um, a lot of good comments from individuals and organizations, uh, of course teachers and of course uh, the states who were, again, the clients for this project put the standards out for comment in many cases and so a lot of great input came in. And if you compare the final version from March 2010 to the public draft version, uh, I think you'll see that the draft made tremendous progress thanks to, the, thanks to that feedback period. Uh, the structure <coughs> of, the, of the development process was, was rather enormous and rather intensive. Um, there was a working group and subcommittees which had State Department of Education staff, professional research mathematicians, uh, experts in um, mathematics education research, uh, practitioners, longtime practitioners, teachers. And again, there were many drafts internal to the process. States gave feedback. There were also uh, groups like National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, both national teachers unions and other groups were brought in to provide feedback internal to the process all before uh, the March 2010 draft came out. And one of the things, so a number of things made this development process different from previous ones. Uh, one was the scope and scale of it. And, and I would say, um, speaking least of all of myself, the uh, tremendous amount of nationwide talent and expertise that were brought to bear on this very intensive process. But one of the other things that made the process different and made the results, I think, better was we were charged to use evidence and to settle arguments uh, through debate and evidence uh, as opposed to merely vehemence or um, trying to just keep peace on a, on a large committee. We used evidence, international and domestic research, major reports and recommendations, uh, research about what is actually required at college and in careers. And uh, if you look at the standards, if you look towards the back, there is, uh, in the math standards, a uh, bibliography that shows some of the works that were consulted, and you'll see different types of research there, some from the business community, some from um, you know, post-secondary instructors, colleges, uh, obviously the best of previous state standards, often out on the desk while we were working, um, as well as, of course, many, many documents about high-performing countries and how they approach things. Excuse me, I'm getting over a bad... Uh, <clears throat> frontal sinus infection, so <clears throat> I'll have to clear my throat and cough a little bit. My ear, nose, and throat specialist does not know I'm here. <laughs> so where the evidence leads us is to the three shifts you've heard so much about, focus, coherence, and rigor. And I'll talk a lot about focus. Um, I'll talk about coherence. Obviously, a lot of the day-to-day -day work uh, in the classroom is, is about making the mathematics coherent and also in the planning. And by rigor, I mean uh, specifically that we're equally passionate about the conceptual understanding of mathematics. Yes, the procedures and the fluency with them and the ability to apply. And all these things are necessary for kids to be prepared, to be college and ready, and to make the kind of progress that they're going to need to get to that point. So I'll say a few words about each of those as I go. <coughs> Excuse me. 
<clears throat> a kind of, um, at first surprising, although I think the more math you know, the less surprising this is. Uh, they looked at countries on TIMS and how well they do. And Hong Kong, which did the best on TIMS uh, in this study, didn't have half the topics on its, in its curriculum. Half the topics on the TIMS test were not in Hong Kong, but they did the better than anyone. And this wasn't just a factoid, it was a general trend in this study that the fewer topics people taught, the better they did on the test. And we'll look into a little bit about why that might be mathematically, but I think for, thank you, I think um, for those of us who think about math, we know that there is uh, a very powerful core that gives kids wings that they can really fly. This is meant to be pictorial, so you don't have to read um, the, the, the labels, the data, I'll, I'll explain it. The, um, is that a laser beam? It is. All right. So, you know, I used to be a physicist, uh, and I own cats. So. Um, these, going down we have topics, so at the, at the beginning you have elementary topics like whole numbers, and going down you have advanced topics like functions. Going across, you have grades. Um, and uh, the A-plus composite curriculum of high-performing countries shows a very interesting structure in which foundations are laid carefully and well, and then you build on them with more advanced ideas. Compare that to, um, and this was in 2002, what was going on in state standards. It's a very different model. You can see at a glance. It's a model in which, um, in any given year, we teach everything that could be taught and probably some things that can't. <laughs> so what does it look like kind of on the ground, as, as, you know, in assessment? The, in Massachusetts, they had the MCAS, uh, you know, always considered the gold standard of state testing systems. And so someone compared that to Hong Kong, going back to the Hong Kong example. and. Uh, so here's a problem. Maria is from the, from the Massachusetts test. Maria is thinking of a number. Here are the clues. It's a multiple of five. It's even. It's less than 18. Which of these could it be? And I'm going to show you four choices. <clears throat> In Hong Kong, there's this lovely problem, which since we're math people, you're probably writing down right now so that you can do it. Um, you know, on its face, it looks like just the long division tableau, and it certainly assumes the long division tableau, but it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question that calls on strategy, reasoning, and fact fluency, and um, of course an understanding of the algorithm that, that is uh, going on. Much more sophisticated problem, much more difficult, much more um, demanding. So they're doing fewer things, but they're asking more of what they are doing. You might say, well, fine, so Hong Kong wins this one, but maybe we're doing, you know, um, Maybe we're doing better pattern work. So let's look at the Massachusetts test. Banana, orange, orange, orange. Banana, orange, orange, orange. Banana, orange, orange, orange. <laughs> let's see what Hong Kong has. <laughs> Guess what? They don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just possible that you can't have this if you have this. Right? There's only so much time in the day. Let's look at estimating computations uh, in this particular grade. You know, we have eight ninety-five for a T-shirt. We buy four shirts. About how much are they? Um, you know, maybe we're doing more sophisticated estimation than the Hong Kong students. Well, I guess so. They didn't have that either. And then there are other example after example where they just didn't find anything over there. So. Um, you know, everybody likes focus, just, just as everybody in Congress likes the idea of cutting the deficit. Once you start getting specific, your poll numbers start going down. So how does the Common Core achieve the focus that we need to achieve? By concentration on arithmetic, and for experts, I will add the aspects of measurement that support it. The K2 grades, a master class in addition and subtraction. That means the concepts of it, which includes place value, and the skills of it, not to be neglected, and knowing what it means so that you can apply it. Grades 3-5 turn to multiplication, division of whole numbers and fractions. Again, in this 
<coughs> uh, full conception of the subject, the concepts, the skills, and the problem solving. That's all well and good. We can all sort of agree with that. There's very little data work in K5. What's there is tightly aligned to these numerical progressions. So for example, in third grade, uh, there uh, are scaled uh, bar graphs. Well, the reason we go from unscaled bar graphs to scaled bar graphs in grade three is that we're going from addition to multiplication when we go from grade two to grade three. So everything is in service to those core progressions and number and operations. <clears throat> so we call it supporting work even when it's there. And I have to remind you, there's very little of it. Statistics per se as a subject matter Topics like outliers or just the notion of distribution. Those topics don't appear until sixth grade. And um, advanced geometry, what, you know, what would be considered in high-performing countries advanced geometry, like congruence and transformations, also wait until middle school. These are the major architectural moves that are in the document that open up the opportunity to do arithmetic much better than we've been doing it and make have students make progress to algebra the way they need to, to be ready for college and careers. So I'll talk more about that as we go. Um, so far, I've talked about early grades. Extremely important to talk at the early grades level. Focus is also important at the top end in high school. There's some interesting findings. They asked um, mathematics educators, both high school and college, do you think your students are prepared for college level work in mathematics? And in one group, 89% said yes, and in another group, 26% said no. And I, even if you can't read these, you can probably guess which group thought the kids were prepared for college level mathematics and which group was not prepared. Now you can ascribe some of this to the, the perennial hobby of educators to blame the people earlier than them in the pipeline for all the problems. But you can't explain away a 90-25 difference that way. There is a disconnect in what's going on in high school versus what kids need in college. Um, the disconnect is not <clears throat> without consequences. Kids, get, kids do everything we ask them to do in K-12. They get to college, they're told it's not enough. They get into remediation. They're paying money out of their own pocket for what they might have learned in high school. And then we know that being in those remedial courses, um, statistically, you're less likely to finish your degree. So it's a kind of um, a, a, a conveyor belt that leads nowhere. <clears throat> Not too long after the Common Core was published, um, Conley and his collaborators did a survey of 1,800 post-secondary instructors, a very broad sample, both two-year and four-year institutions, business majors, health, you know, professors, health sciences, all, all across the board, um, English language arts as well as math and, phys and science. And they had them go through and look at every single Common Core standard and answer various questions like, is this a prerequisite for the work you do in your introductory courses? Is this important within your introductory courses? Is this something that is introduced in a later course? Uh, so we have some survey data on, um, as I say, every single Common Core standard. And if you uh, kind of bundle up those numbers and you just give a heuristic, how important is each content cluster in high school? And then by cluster, I mean you know, the bold faced things. Um, uh, that, are, that are just below the, the domains, like um, I'm blanking, I'm picturing one. <clears throat> Understand solving equations as a process of reasoning and explain the reasoning, for example. At the cluster level, you find there are strong peaks of importance according to the post-secondary folks. In general, algebra uh, comes across as important across this wide sample and number and quantity. Sometimes as, a, as an activity with teachers, I leave the um, domain names blank and we try to fill in. Well, wh what would you think? Uh, and then there's some interesting things here. Like with statistics and probability, it's certainly very relevant to post-secondary work, and yet it doesn't come across as important in these studies. And perhaps one reason is that although it's very relevant to post-secondary work, post-secondary educators are also very willing to teach it to you. But if you get there without algebra, you're in big trouble. That's not something they're set up to do. Uh, you can also just sort it um, in this way, and you see that, that there's a bulk that really we need to be spending the majority of the kids' time on. You can look at it standard by standard. Every dot here is a standard. Um, over here, 
if, if it's over here, no, no professors in the entire survey said it was applicable to what they do. Uh, if it's over here, 60% said it was applicable to what they do. So more applicable is over here. Now, um, whether it's a prerequisite for what they do is another dimension. And the stuff that is most applicable and most prerequisite, see a lot of A's up there, that's algebra stuff. There's some other things too. Uh, and then there's a kind of a dust moats that we have to think about policy-wise and curriculum-wise. But So focus is also important um, at the higher level, although it ha the question has a different complexion. Now, um, what's up above where you can't see is it says coherence. So I'm going to start talking about coherence now, which um, basically has a horizontal and a vertical dimension. So it means thinking across grades and, and also linking to the major topics within the grades. So across grades, uh, Amy talked about you know, a coherent plan in the standards, and that didn't come by accident. We looked at a lot of research for this. On the left is a composite curriculum of um, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Korea, and it explains how they work up to division of a fraction by a fraction. Some previous state standards were um, closer to this some were further, none were as coherent as this. And in the Common Core, uh, tracing the progression of multiplication, division, and fractions is, is one way to illustrate one of the coherent progressions that are there. So that's vertical, grade to grade. <clears throat> and we benefited from a great deal of research on those questions in designing the grade to grade progressions. Um, horizontally, within a single grade, <laughs> You know, in third grade, you have some big topics, multiplication, division, kind of the story of grade three, really, and then properties of operations, like the distributive property, and then area. And if you think about these things, there are some really important connections between them. Uh, obviously, uh, the distributive property relates multiplication to addition, and it's part of um, figuring out how to work with products, and it will be the building blocks of all the multi-digit algorithms. So you need to connect these properties to what you're doing. Area, you want to be making models that show multiplication and division because you'll use those models to develop standard algorithms. And you can also uh, show how the properties of operations are true with area models, right? So these connections are important. We didn't want to leave those connections to chance. We didn't want to just have some stuff on multiplication and division, some stuff on properties, and some stuff on area. So we made specific standards that draw these connections. So if you look at 3MD7C, it's a standard about showing the distributive property through an area model. So the standards are meant to help people make the most important connections by making them actually nodes in the network. Um, <clears throat> moving to rigor and the kind of being equally passionate about the conceptual understanding, the procedural skill, the fluency of the, the procedures and the application. Let me give a couple of examples of this conceptual understanding. You know, we've all been there. I was there as a, as a college professor the night before. What am I going to teach tomorrow? I go on the web <laughs> and find some interesting things sometimes. Well, if you go online and you search for, you know, place value worksheet, uh, you get things that look a lot like this, 234, hundreds, tens, ones, hundreds, tens, ones. Heck, even the title of the thing is hundreds, tens, ones. Um, do enough of these, and any child with any intelligence is going to learn that in order to pacify you, you put the first number in the first blank, the second number in the second blank, and the third number in the third blank. They're not thinking about place value. They're not learning about place value. I don't know what it is they're doing. They're alphabetizing, maybe. So, um, so we tried to make some conceptual questions that would bring the mathematics closer to the foreground in a lightweight way. I mean, these are still fill in the blanks. Um, the f top one says, you know, 100 plus 4 tens is what number? And then we immediately follow that up. 4 tens and 100 is what number? So I'm getting to the idea that it doesn't matter what order I add things in commutatively. Right, that's also here, but of course, in the place value positional notation system, order is everything. So this makes you think about the rules, the societal rules for the orders in which we list these digits. Uh, this is about 
<clears throat> the recursive bundling and unbundling of these units. 14 tens could be thought of as 10 tens and 4 tens, or it could be thought of as 100 and 4 tens, or it could be thought of 1, 141s, if you like. So when I talk about conceptual understanding, I don't necessarily mean that there's, um, that the only way to talk about that is to be talking a lot. I mean, I think that there's a lot of room to improve even, even the very simple and scalable problems that we do toward conceptual understanding. You know, I sometimes hear people anxiety that we're trying to turn children into junior mathematicians. Uh, I don't actually think that's accurate. <clears throat> um, but I want to give the texture of it a little bit. So at my own, at my own uh, dinner table, you can imagine we talk about math to some extent. And um, my younger daughter's favorite museum in New York is the Museum of Mathematics. She wears her t-shirt. Museum. Of I had nothing to do with it, I promise. And so she had, uh, for dessert, six little candy hearts on her plate. And I said, so um, Claire, how many do you have? And she's four. Uh, and she, she looked at it and she said, six. And I said, if you eat three, how many will you have? And she, she said, three. Because three plus three is six. Which was a wonderful thing for her to say. Because it shows that she understands subtraction as a missing add-end problem. She's understanding the subtraction in terms of addition. And I said, well, that's 1.08.7 off my list. I can just check that one, and I'll give it to her first grade teacher and say, you don't need to worry about that. But the point of the story is that I didn't belabor it. I didn't turn her into a junior mathematician. I wasn't doing some kind of age-inappropriate thing. Um, this can be lightweight. But there has to be room in the curriculum, in the classroom, um, I know in most households there's not room for it, but sorry, there's <clears throat> more to that statement than I, than I originally thought. <clears throat> so it's not about turning people into junior mathematicians or any of those kind of crass characterizations, but it is to say that mathematics is a discipline of ideas, and if you're not thinking, you're not doing it, unless you're executing an algorithm, in which case if you're thinking, you're not doing it. Which brings us to fluency. Standards are very clear on fluency expectations. This is not fuzzy. In every grade, there is a, a fluency expectation, and the word fluently is not ambiguous. It means accurate and reasonably quickly. These are carefully integrated with the developing mathematics that students are learning. But they are there as important checkpoints, kind of canaries in a coal mine. You know, is this working? Are kids getting to the level they need to, to get with these procedures? So um, some of these are of, of the form knowing your facts. Some of these are about uh, executing algorithms. Here's an example problem. <clears throat> this would be, I guess, a sort of a later grades problem. Um, Looks like uh, fifth grade to sixth grade, depending, right? So if A is 356 times 618 and B is 2.4 divided by 0.1, what is A divided by B divided by 18? In math, sometimes, as in life, you just have to grind it out. And this is an important outcome of our math education system. We no longer want it to be the only outcome, but, no longer, but nor is it an outcome that the standards are meant to make us flee. Application. It's very important that kids in any grade or course be ready for their next grade or math course. But math courses have to do more than just prepare you for your next math course. We spend, what, um, on the order of 1% of our GDP on math education? We need, we need to have that uh, spill over out of the math classroom itself so that kids can apply what they know. And in early grades, this can be, um, you know, pretty humble. On Wednesday, Joe walked, uh, sorry, um, on Tuesday, Joe walked a half mile. Um, actually, on Monday, he walked a half mile. Then Tuesday, something else happens. On Wednesday, he walked some more. And then altogether, he walked two and a half miles. And so how far did he walk? <clears throat> this is, quote, unquote, just a word problem. It has an algebraic structure. Uh, it's not a, like, kind of get the result word problem. It's the kind of word problem that we hope students would be working with in first or second grade with whole numbers, and then they see it again uh, in here. This could be fourth grade. 
with fractions, and then see it again with variables in middle grades, and then see it again with variable expressions um, in high school. The, the uses of addition and subtraction, the elementary uses of addition and subtraction, there are 15 of them, and in a coherent program, they kind of ought to recur in this way as students or work with more and more sophisticated objects. But by the time you get into high school, applications you know, should also be robust and, and look, begin to look more like the work kids are going to do after they leave high school. So here's one about propane tanks. Um, the, the width of this collar section is 10 feet and it's fixed and you can play with the radius and the goal is to double the volume uh, by working with the radius. This is an interesting problem to play with, um, comes from the Shell Center. It generates a cubic equation for R. Students are not taught in the traditional math curriculum to solve cubic equations algebraically. So they themselves have to say, well, gosh, this might be a chance, a time when I should graph something and come up with a numerical result. Nor, but nor does it prompt them to go to their calculator and figure that out. So technology, we want them to be strategic in the way they use technology. That's one of the mathematical practice standards. There are good times and bad times to use technology. So we have concepts, conceptual understanding, firm command, and fluency of the procedures, and the ability to apply what we know. It's a, it's a picture away from a shallow command of a, 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 a bewildering array of things to a firm command of the powerful few. Sometimes, now if you've ever read my physics textbook, that you're familiar with my horrible artistic ability, and you'll recognize the genre. Um, think of it as like a staircase. The, at the top it says college and career readiness and beyond are steps away by grade eight. Those are some additional steps away. We have to put kids in a position to get there, especially by grade eight. It's a steep staircase, you know. Um, to the limits of my artistic ability, this kid is working hard. <laughs> <laughs> to get up that staircase, we focus to allow the coherence and rigor that they're going to need to get to the jumping off point where they're ready to be um, steps away from college and readiness and beyond. This, um, <clears throat> for those of you who know the publisher's criteria, the progress to algebra, the table one in the publisher's criteria is a sort of a content axis for this kind of staircase. This picture, how does this picture differ from what we had? You know, one is college and career readiness and beyond have to be steps away by the time we get there. And that, that, that makes it um, a, a climb. And it's going to be hard work for you and for your students to climb this way. We've had, we've had a kind of a different situation. The college career ready staircase, the sturdy staircase that's traced out in the common core is here, we've had a kind of a different situation <clears throat> where by the time the students get to grade eight, they're not steps away from college and career readiness and beyond. And, you know, all, nobody has the exact numbers on this yet, but all indications are that we have about a third of the kids who, who are on track for that college and career readiness. And it's partly the staircase that's... Um, not designed to get us there. You know, it's a, funny th it's a funny thing to put a mortarboard on a kindergartner in a picture. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be a mortarboard. But it, I did it because I, there's a story. I was working with teachers, um, and one teacher um, from a large urban school district, we were talking about kindergarten. We were talking about the major work of kindergarten. And it's some tough stuff, you know. It's, uh, knowing the partners to 10, being able to add and subtract, being able to abstract fluently within five, and um, elements of place value, like Amy showed in that, that beautiful illustration of the cascading red dots that show the kind of high stakes nature of this. And she said, you know, I can see how this would be the major work of kindergarten for kids who are going to college, but my kids are not going to college. I thought, you know, these kids are five years old. So we have to look ahead. We have to see where, where this is all going and understand why it's different. Um, 
And it's, and it's not just the kids who are in situations like that either. Building this strong foundation is going to be good for the kids who are going to go very far, for the kids who are going to take calculus, the kids who are going to be the future of physicists. This is, um, high performing countries are not doing this because they're not interested in high performance. So it's not new names for old ways of doing business. I want to <clears throat> talk a little bit now, shift a little bit to tools. And um, some of you may know this is Achieve the Core. This is my organization's website. Student Achievement Partners is a nonprofit organization. Um, our, our mission is to design actions based on evidence that will raise student achievement. And um, for the Common Core, we, we help states and districts understand and implement them well. We aim to work with teachers to create tools to do that. We've worked with many of you, as I've said, and want to work with you more. Um, and I'll show just a couple things. You know, you can go and say grade seven. Pretend I had selected grade five because what I'm about to show is the grade five um, major work um, uh, cluster emphases diagram. So in grade five, it's all well and good to say focus. Y you um, need to know what I'm talking about when I say that. And these handouts help a lot because for each of the clusters in uh, here it is grade five, they have the major clusters in green and the supporting clusters in blue, which are opportunities to actually use those topics to develop or enrich the major work uh, and the additional work. You know, it's got to get done, um, but it's not the major work and we have to be clear about that. I have a lot of additional work in my life as a husband and parent and employee and it, it's not that I don't do it, but I know what my major work is and what I'm supposed to be doing each day. And, um, where I can spend most of my time. So this is for each grade, you can get these on Achieve the Core. It's also um, reminders of the fluency and the uh, kind of a high level highlight that people want to start. On the back page of it is this um, subset of the major work, Progress to Algebra. This again is from the publisher's criteria, but it's conveniently on these handouts and it reminds us of this velocity that, that we need to have. If kids are going to get to college and career readiness. Um, sometimes people look at this and they say, well, yeah, sounds great. Uh, what about the critical areas that are in the standards? Has anybody read those, right? Like the, the pages things? And it's interesting. So the critical areas, if you read them and see what they are, they're actually a sort of a survey of the grade, right? And so something that is meant to be a survey is not intended to, nor can it really tell you where to focus or where the emphases are. It's, it's not in the nature of a survey. The word critical helps remind us that nothing in there is optional, right, or there's going to be gaps. But I just want to point out something about the critical areas, too. I went and I looked at one of the grades here, and, um, you know, we don't recommend counting standards to make decisions <laughs> or counting words or counting things like that. Those, those methodologies all have their drawbacks, but it is kind of interesting. I went through the critical areas here and highlighted in green all the verbiage that was about the major work and highlighted in blue uh, the other, which in this case is all um, additional work. Uh, and if you simply count the words, it's 80%. 80% of the talk here is about the major work. There's a reason 80% of the talk is about the major work. It's because it's more complicated. This, this is uh, um, you know, grade four MBT, and you see it's kind of quite a thicket of ideas, just as Amy was showing. And you can compare it to a grade four geometry, which is more sparse. There's, not, there's less of it there, and the interconnections are less. Now, as a professor, I know anything can be made arbitrarily complex. But some things are unavoidably complex. And that's why they need more time and uh, a better, richer presentation. The Smarter Balanced Test Specifications have, have, uh, have this built in. They use M for the major work, and um, they lump additional and supporting together into one category for simplicity. Likewise, the Park Assessment Consortium as well, and um, the Council of Chief State School Officers is trying to support state superintendents um, in getting good assessment systems for their states. And you know, the first principle in mathematics assessments is to focus strongly on the content most needed for success in later math. And it talks about arithmetic, ratio, proportion, relationships, and so on. Not, not controversial statements, but it's helpful. It's helpful to know 
uh, that these things are aligned. <clears throat> Other leadership tools I want to talk about, um, the instructional practice guide. We worked with um, a number of districts, Charlotte Danielson and others, a number of experts, um, Phil Darrow, Steve Limewan, and others, to work on these observation guides that begin to get at the question, what does it look like in the classroom? These are not evaluation tools. These are not accountability tools. We're partnered with both national teachers unions on this project. These are observation, uh, meant to be observational um, and formative. And they talk about, um, you know, all students having a chance to uh, contribute, that students are making arguments and revising what they say and, and on and on. It gives them a little bit more of the texture of what it's like day to day. And some of you I know have seen some of these things. And there, is, there are sections. One is kind of the planning phase. Another is the delivery of, of instruction, you know, actually in the classroom. And then another is a kind of over the year phase. So those are there. Um, there's an alignment toolkit, which includes um, instructional materials evaluation tool. We partnered with um, Council of the Great City Schools in many districts uh, to uh, develop a rubric for saying, are these books focused, coherent, rigorous? Are they um, connecting the mathematical practices to content? Do they have any number of quality indicators? And it's based on the publisher's criteria. In, um, some states have used it. We've gotten a lot of good feedback on it, including from publishers. Uh, and in April, uh, we'll be rolling out um, a much improved version too, so we'll make sure to blast that out. Uh, and um, it's the kind of thing I, I think that could be used at different levels the state, the, from a state that has an interest in that. Some states don't work on the textbook question. They have very strong local control, and that's great. It can work at the district level or even at the school level, depending how that's done. <clears throat> Also, there are some, try this in your classroom, tasks and, and assessment ideas. Uh, you know, we've partnered with a lot of people, Illustrated Mathematics, our, our first batch was Illustrated Mathematics. So these are things, they're not meant to be, you know, a Googleable library like, ah, tomorrow I need to do place value. It's, it's more, they're more meant to illustrate shifts and show some of the variety of what's, of what's out there in, in a faithful implementation of the standards. So this would be, you know, Fishing Adventures 2 task. I think that one came from, yeah, Illustrative Math. So those we're always adding and, and improving and uh, recommend you have a look at those and think about what it would be like. Now, focusing sounds great. Everything is harder than it sounds. Uh, I talk to people, I talk to teachers about this and they say, I can't really focus because, you know, my kids are too low, my kids are too high, and my evaluation is going to ding me for this. Um, you know, here in Nevada, the state CRT test, my math book doesn't do it. I don't have resources or time. These are real and tricky issues. And the last thing I want to do is uh, sound glib or, or suggest that these answers are easy. I, just, I did want to throw out a couple of thoughts on some of them. Um, and you know, people can grab me during the day and um, we can talk more about it. First, on the my kids are too low, <coughs> You know what, uh, and I'm going to talk outside of my <clears throat> expertise about the literacy standards, so some of the literacy folks here can correct me if I get this wrong, but I think of this as being a little bit like text complexity in, in the English language arts standards. A lot of teachers at the beginning looked at the standards and said, and looked at a piece of text that was grade level text and said, my kids can never read that. And then they started trying it, and they found that Lo and behold, the kids were surprising them. It doesn't mean that they never have to have recourse to level readers or guided reading or whatever the interventions are for differentiation. It doesn't mean they never do that. But it means that every kid gets extensive um, work with grade level text. Likewise in math, we know there are kids who are a couple grades behind who have missed, who don't have the red dots that Amy showed us. We know that happens, and so we know differentiation has to happen. But as with English language arts literacy, the seeming virtue of differentiation can also imprison kids at the level they're in. So it's again a balancing act. You know you gotta do it, you know sometimes that that's the right thing to do, but also every kid needs extensive experience with grade level content. 
we know they're going to have unfinished learning, right? You're going to be doing long division in sixth grade and fifth grade. They're not even going to know. They're going to have problems with place value. They're going to have unfinished learning about place value. Well, instead of backing them up to third grade or second grade to talk about place value, you can also handle that. You can use the teaching of long division in fifth grade as an occasion to address the unfinished learning that they have. Or with fractions, you know, doing linear equations in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. We know that they're fractions, they have unfinished learning. Well, what, the way we've always coped with that is we've taken all the fractions out of algebra. So <laughs> we want to teach them so much about the moves of solving that we get the fractions out. But that just produces a perversion of algebra that doesn't help them build later on advanced math. So you could also imagine using linear equations as an occasion not only to deal with grade level content, but also to handle some of the unfinished learning about fractions. So, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim that that's easy or that materials out there help you do a great job with that. But I'm just asking you to think about a mindset in which differentiation is not the only answer and that kids are gonna need, every kid needs extensive work with grade level content. And that grade level content can be an occasion to handle unfinished learning instead of um, either a reason to abandon grade level content um, or a reason to um, distort grade level content. <clears throat> so there's a couple, there's just a couple words about that. Now, my kids are too high. Um, kids definitely need intellectual nourishment, for sure. And um, give it to them. As, as with the kids being too low, there are options, I think, that we don't consider enough. So ask yourself, does it really nourish that high-performing kid to give them next year's relatively shallow math problems? Or would it be better to give them harder problems on the content of the grade? You can make very difficult problems out of grade-level content. If you have very high-performing kids, they'll thrive on hard problems. It's conceivable they would thrive better on harder problems about this year's stuff than commodity problems on next year's stuff. Now, you're going to have acceleration policies. You should have acceleration policies. I'm not pronouncing on acceleration policies. I'm only trying to point out that one way to give intellectual nourishment to a kid who really needs it is to take the math that you're doing and give them harder problems, by which I mean you know, problems with less scaffolding, Problems where you expect, just the way you would with a mathematician or an expert, multiple solution approaches. Problems where you um, expect more cogent accounts of what just happened. Problems where you stress more abstract approaches to the question. Um, and problems that are just simply more difficult in the content. Those are all ways to give intellectual nourishment um, to kids who are very high performing um, without diluting focus. And in either case, whether you're going kind of above grade or below grade, it's better to kind of see yourself sliding along the progress to algebra continuum as opposed to moving off the reservation to the work that's not major work. So thinking of that as the basic axis and trying to give some, some ideas or strategies for dealing with these things. Standards didn't create this problem, by the way, either. A anytime you choose one textbook as a teacher, you've got kids who are, quote, unquote, too high for that textbook and kids who are, quote, unquote, too low for that textbook. It's a condition of teaching. It, the standards didn't create that. Now, evaluation, I understand the superintendent's going to fix all that. No, um, the state test, you know, remember Hong Kong, right? <laughs> they didn't have half the topics. They did be the best in the world. I can think of, suppose, just to make the numbers easy, suppose that getting half the points on the test is passing. I'm going to be a really crass, like, test prep consultant, right? Suppose getting half the test on the points is passing. I could imagine two ways for my kids to get half the points on the test. One is every question is a coin flip, right? They're going to get half the points. The other is they get 80% right on the half that matters and they get 20% right on the rest. 
Now, it's hard to get 20% on a multiple choice test. You have to work at that. So that's pessimistically. But if you get 80% of the stuff that matters and 20% of the other, you still get your half points. The kids have the same test score, but I know which kid I would rather be my kid. The kid who has the 80% lock on the stuff that really matters. So I think there are some knee-jerk assumptions about how to game tests that, um, that don't take into account the special structure of mathematics as a discipline. Now, the book, um, there's a lot we can talk about this, so the, they could all go, you know, all these things are long discussions, but I wanted to, part one of the reasons I wanted to list this is that these are questions that I know that um, Northern Nevada teachers have asked. Uh, I was sent these, and I, and I wanted you to know that we spend a lot of time thinking about them, and that you guys are great thought partners with us. Uh, we don't have answers. I think answers will come from you all. There are a lot of other problems on the horizon, you know, uh, tracking and acceleration, the question of eighth grade algebra one. There are a lot of implementation questions. Politics and activism is a huge part of this now over the last year. The standards have become a political question. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the day. Um, but you've been very patient and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak to you and I'm really excited to be walking around today and uh, meeting a lot of you in person and, and coming back at the end of the day. Thanks so much. And I've lost my watch, so I don't actually know if I'm over, if we have time for questions. Okay, we have time for some questions. <clears throat> Yes. Congratulations again, by the way. Can you define for us what the definition of a standard algorithm is? Uh, the, you know, I'll tell, just tell a funny story. Uh, a special subcommittee of the working group was designated to, def to define um, the standard algorithm for each of the four operations. And so they were sent into a room, and no one came out alive. <laughs> <clears throat> so the term is not defined in the glossary of the standards. Um, the progressions documents shed some light on this. I think I would try to read them carefully. That would be the, the best place to go for um, insight into this question. I think in specific cases, um, certainly any algorithm you teach kids ever. So number one, um, I'm 45. I know what the standard algorithm is. I think you all do too. It involves scratching things out and carrying ones and doing all that stuff. I'm happy to call that the standard algorithm. Uh, I can't consider the partial products algorithm the standard algorithm for multiplication, for example. So there are things I feel that I know and could say about this, um, but a definition of the standard algorithm, you know, there's a, there's a paper in the AMS Monthly from High Bass, Hyman Bass, he's a, he's a mathematician at the University of Michigan who works on uh, school mathematics a lot. It's a wonderful article by Hyman Bass, and it gives as much as you could give as a mathematician's definition of the standard algorithm and what are its essential mathematical features. There are going to be details of the bookkeeping. You know, when I was taught the standard algorithm for multiplication, either I learned or taught myself this weird thing of putting my carries all over the paper. You know, like they're there, and I think I only wrote them so that they would be remembered in my brain. I never even look at them. But anyway, they're all over the paper. So I wouldn't want someone to look at my paper and say, whoa, not standard. You know, <laughs> you can't write that in that corner. There are details of bookkeeping that we shouldn't be beleaguering kids about. Um, but the essence of um, the highly efficient uh, and general standard algorithm are, are part of what it means. And, and I would recommend, by the way, also, that as um, I think Tracy was saying, a very close reading of the standards on this, the, the progression in the early grades from strategies to algorithms to the standard algorithm is carefully wrought. Um, the standard algorithm is not just tossed in, it's, it's designed for. Yeah. <clears throat>
Yeah, I think that, you know, um, uh, Bill McCallum, Phil Dara, and I wrote um, uh, just a little think piece comparing the standards to a Grecian urn. And uh, that's on Common Core Tools uh, blog that Bill runs. And there we made the point that, like with, you know, not to say these standards are a work of art, right? But if you're looking at a work of art, you constantly have to flicker your attention between the parts and the whole. If you only ever look at the outline of the vase, you may feel like you have a grasp of the thing and you may feel that that's better than being bogged down in details, but you haven't actually looked at the vase until you've also looked at every detail of the vase. And so, likewise, you can get lost in the details and miss the point. So I actually think that with any intricate or complex object like a standards document, you have to flit around from level to level in a kind of an unstable way until you begin to get an appreciation for the whole. So there's no right answer in terms of a war between cluster and standard. It's, I'm afraid, more complicated than that. I will say that in the latest edition of, uh, that CCS so put out, thanks to um, you know, Bill, Phil, and I urged this very strongly, the cluster headings now have labels so that we can at least talk about them. So I can now at least talk about one MBTC, right? And, and the, the, the machine of public education knows how to grab it, right? So that will help the clusters be more prominent. And it's important that they be prominent because they're kind of, they often tell the forest. You need the forest. Like, Okay, what all this stuff is about is applying and extending previous understandings of addition and subtraction from whole numbers to add and subtract fractions. Like, okay, that's my mission, kind of, with this chunk of stuff, and I shouldn't forget that. Even as each of those individual performances is very important and will, will and should be measured, got to remember the, the big idea. And another thing about that cluster heading example that I gave is it gives a sense of velocity, right? So the cluster heading isn't just addition and subtraction of fractions, right? It's not a noun phrase, it's not a topic. <coughs> what it says is we're gonna apply previous understandings and extend those understandings in order to add and subtract the fractions. So some cluster headings actually give you a hint about progression, and they're an economical way to do that if you learn how to read them that way. So I like having a list of like, you know, the eight to 11 cluster headings in the grade as a kind of a game plan for the grade, but you know, they also don't replace some of the details which are also extremely important. You know, if you're only looking at cluster headings, you're not gonna get area models and the distributor property. There, there are lots of nice little Easter eggs at the detailed level too, so um, it is really, a measure. and, and it, we can go up even higher you know, if you look at the fact, the Common Core is the first set of state standards that use ratios and proportional relationships as a top level organizer. So although there may not be many standards in that section, that choice, that authorial choice to use the literacy theme, tells a lot about the intended importance of that material. So all levels of the hierarchy communicate and um, should be attended to. Yeah. Oh, you know, the, the, that was up there for sure. Let me, I'll try to see. Here's, I did a little bit on it um, here, but it's, you know, Amy did a wonderful thing where she said, suppose this is not there in this grade, and it has all these impacts downstream, and it was really nice. I've never seen anyone do that. By the way, I, I wrote that as almost a sort of a research thing. It's, it's wonderful to see that people are finding it useful. Uh, it does come, you know, if you go to tinyurl.com slash graph, you'll see there's a lot of introduction to it and a lot of... Um, you know, qualifiers and explanation of what it is and is not. So if you're really using it, you want to make sure you've at least got lying around somewhere to the preamble. <coughs> Tinyurl.com slash graph, I think is where I housed it. Someone out there put up a clickable version too, but don't let anyone sell it to you. I did it a, a, a under a grant, so it's supposed to be free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, I actually have gone to a couple of symposiums and in California and in Nevada. And the big question and the big buzz seems to be materials. And we all know everyday math, Excel math, Singapore math, Saxon math, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I find that most people are having the same thing as nobody knows what to do other than build their own blend. And then it seems that anywhere you go to look at materials, whether you're, you know, researching online or people are, you know, I'm trying this, I'm trying that, I'm trying this. And the buzzword on all of the materials that are coming out is 
is common core. But they all look very different. They all use different vocab some different vocabulary, different you know, wording in the prompts for grade levels. And I'd like to know if you have a recommendation on how to weed through all this common core that's out there so that we have a better guidelines of what to put into our classes. Thanks. You know, two studies came out in the last week or two, and I haven't yet had time to read either, so I only know from headlines. But from headlines, you know, it's, um, there would seem to be some truth to the argument that many publishers are just kind of slapping a sticker on the thing and saying it's Common Core. <clears throat> I think that um, one, of the, one of the most important things to do is to understand the standards yourselves so that you can be good consumers of these things, you know, because the publishers will sell things hard. And of course they're going to say they're aligned and they're going to make the best argument that they can for that. The publisher's criteria were the first attempt to um, express what alignment looks like in a way that's not just a crosswalk and not just lip service and not just labeling. I recommend people could read that the instructional materials evaluation tool which came from that is also another tool that we want people to use to be critical consumers of textbooks. It's also something that we want publishers to work with and understand and work with us on because um, it has been slow, the movement of publishers. Some much faster than others though. And, and so it has to happen on both sides. <clears throat> the market has to be intelligent in its demands and the publishers have to be willing to respond. And I'm optimistic that they will. It's, it's, the content industrial complex in the United States is gigantic. And you can't make a wheel suddenly spin up, you know, or change direction that has been spinning a certain way. So it's inevitably difficult and challenging right now for teachers. The one thing I just want to point out what you said is that all these things look different and they all say they're common core. I think it's probably uh, permanent condition of curricula that people have different takes on how to do it and that will be true that was true before the common core it will be true after the idea that the common core is gonna is gonna you know make a, a restrictive single curriculum has never been convincing to me as, as a textbook author I mean you uh, this diversity you know I have not I've not yet seen any evidence of that now I would say we have too much diversity right now in how much people are focusing on the major work of the grade the standards do have implications for a curriculum or they're not standards. But the look and feel and general approach of things is different, has always been different and will continue to be. And it will be, like it or not, up to the market to choose well. I've seen examples sometimes in the news of you know, a lousy quiz that a kid had to take because of the common core. Well, somebody bought that textbook. It wasn't me. <laughs> Somebody's giving out that lousy quiz, and so we, we really need to all take ownership uh, of this thing and make good choices. And at Student Team Partners, we're trying to make the tools that will help people do that at scale. But it's slow, it's difficult, and, and I know your job is made hard by this. Uh, yes, in the middle, the purple. standards. And one thing I want to point out is that one of the uh, important sources, there were many important sources for the K2 documents. One of them was narratives of research on um, children's learning of mathematics that the working group commissioned from some of the best education researchers in the country. Those can be seen actually as the um, germ of the current progression documents, although they're in a different genre. So, so we began with research like that. The National Research Council report um, uh, Mathematics Learning in Early Childhood, Paths Towards Excellence and Equity was an important source of the content knowledge that's in the early grade standards. <clears throat> the members of that panel, the early math panel, were well represented in the Common Core Working Group. Uh, Doug Clements from the University of Buffalo, uh, SUNY Buffalo, uh, and Karen Fusen 
from um, uh, a, a nationally recognized expert on education were both on the early math panel. They both were writing the na national math panel, the um, National Research Council report, and they were very invested and <clears throat> involved in the development of the standards, as were, of course, many teachers and practicing teachers. I went, um, when the standards were still being written, and as I said, uh, many organizations, including both unions, were, were consulted and involved throughout. The American Federation of Teachers took Bill McCallum and myself hostage, and uh, I don't remember what city it was. You know, they don't, they, don't, they don't let you see outside the van. But when we got there, <laughs> there were, you know, 30 teachers from across the country who had taken a weekend to fly to wherever this was and um, tell us everything that was wrong with the draft they had seen. And boy, did they tell us. You know, there was red marks all over the thing when we left. Huge improvements. And I remember directly sitting across the table um, from one of the AFT teachers, um, wonderful woman, we're, we're friends now, and she had spent her whole life teaching little children. And she had a lot to add in this. So you can hear sometimes this meme that early childhood folks were not consulted. It's not true. After the public draft came out, there was a, there was a meeting held at the Erickson Institute, which is, um, about early childhood education, and Doug Clements attended that meeting and brought back their feedback on the public draft, and changes were made. So for example, I'll just give one small example. In kindergarten, in the public draft, it says that kids will understand the concept of a 10. The feedback from Erickson was that that is a sophisticated idea and belongs in first grade. And in kindergarten, the change was then to understand that a teen number, like 13, is 10 ones and some more ones. You see the difference from a 10 and some more ones? You have to learn units in order to understand the concept of a 10. We moved that out of kindergarten into first grade based on feedback. There was a lot of research, a lot of feedback. Now I do understand that the resulting picture, although it's based on extensive feedback from the nation's best experts and all the research we had from this country and other countries who are doing this stuff, it looks different from what's going on. It's a big shift. You know, I think back to the teacher who said, this is not what I teach for my kids who are, by the way, not going to college. So it is a change. Um, I think it, it, it may put pressure on some um, habits and some approaches to mathematics. I think it certainly asks early grades teachers to learn more about the math uh, and, and and I hope that that is an interesting journey for them. But, um, you know, my daughter, <clears throat> I have two daughters, one I haven't told the story about yet, so I better get to the other one, um, is in first grade. And <laughs> the irony, I, I have no say in her math curriculum, right? So comes home and I'm like, you know, there's a lot of first grade Common Core stuff that I'm not seeing, and it makes me nervous, and I, so I work on it with her, and. Um, I think that um, we do have a lot to do culturally, educationally, and in terms of materials to make uh, the early grade standards a reality in early grades classrooms. But I would hate to see a kind of false prejudice or myth that they were created in a vacuum that didn't take into account early childhood issues impede our progress there. Yes. So, knowing that we need to understand standards, where, where do you see teachers, how does that professional development look then to help those teachers understand standards? Because, you know, some of the teachers don't really have that mathematical background as they might in reading or, or whatnot, unless they seek that out in a <laughs> Well, you know, we can talk about pre service teacher preparation. It's a big subject in a hugely complicated area, but yeah, for teachers now, I mean, some, some of the activities that we know are going on, um, you know, that Amy does, are great ways to get into it, right? When I've worked with teachers, sometimes I take one standard, and I say, let's read this thing. We do like a close reading, I guess. I don't know if that's the right phrase from literacy, but we say, let's read this thing. And pretty soon people are asking, well, why does it say this? And why doesn't it say that? And then we look ahead a grade. We look back a grade. And 
the conversation it starts, you know, like pulling a thread. Eventually, you know, you, you unravel a whole set of issues. And that's important learning. You know, I've, uh, there's a mathematician who's been working with teachers on, on math for 20 years, and he said, thanks to the Common Core, for the first time, I have teachers coming to me and saying, I want to learn this math. That's great, and I think it's important. But that learning also, as we know, has to be very situated in people's day-to-day -day work, situated in the tools they're using, <clears throat> or the research shows that it doesn't really translate into the kids doing better, which is what we all want. So fashioning those programs is very tricky. It requires a comprehensive approach. But I think the standards are effectively a great textbook for school mathematics, um, and we've never had that in a way that crosses state lines, that works for universities, which cross state lines anyway. So I, I would hope that the standards are the beginning of a revolution in the way um, teachers learn mathematics. But for right now, we need to see lots of the, the kinds of efforts that Amy talked about so that teachers feel supported and get what they need. <clears throat> it's not, there's no way I can wave a wand and make the, the lesson turn from A to B. That takes work, professional learning communities, all the things that you guys know and I'm sure work hard um, to build. But it takes a fully functioning system. Great, so um, how are we on time? I think. Okay, great. So, yes, please. Um, thank you for the math I've used the literacy more than I've used the math. And, you know, it's, it's a great tool and resource. How do you see that site going? What's the, the vision for the future with that site? One of the, one of the most important <clears throat> things I think people will notice about Achieve the Core is that some of these uh, important tools that we've talked about, like the instructional practice guide, and the instructional materials evaluation tool or, and or others, um, vocabulary, since you talked about um, the literacy side. We have a lot of paper about that stuff now, and you can get the paper from the site, but we're working on and we're funded to work on digital versions of those things. We're piloting the instructional practice guide for mobile so that teachers can watch each other and, and enter the things. We're piloting um, a vocabulary tool that will be digital. So turning some of our tools, making them more usable uh, on the ground, in real life, in the digital ecosystem is one of the things that we're doing. Uh, we're working with partners like Illustrated Mathematics, Khan Academy, and others to both help them shape their work as well as um, bring more content to the site. And as I say, it's never going to be a library or a Rolodex of things but we want to have more and more up there, and we're, we're looking at um, developing a couple of model units that we can um, use to illustrate in more concrete ways ideas like handling unfinished learning in the context of grade level work. Um, obviously focus and um, conceptual understanding and, and all those things. You kind of need to work at the level of a unit before you can see all those things coming together. So, <clears throat> so we're um, anticipating putting some of those up there. And those can be learning tools. Those can be, those can be things maybe publishers could learn from, but they can also be things that learning, professional learning communities can learn from. Yes? You know, um, my parent-teacher conference was pretty unusual, I guess, you know. <laughs> I, I showed up uh, to my daughter's teacher and <clears throat> made it a point really not to talk a lot about math. It just seemed like the best thing to do. But those, those interactions are tough. You know, I was at a panel um, in Washington, D.C., where um, they brought teachers from Alabama, Arkansas, uh, Chicago, I think Atlanta, and they all talked about the Common Core and what it was like, and this issue of working with parents came up. And um, one of the teachers had a funny line that she won Twitter that day by saying, you know, here in Alabama, the kids are handling the Common Core better than the grown-ups. <laughs> but she did talk about talking to parents, and she said, you know, what I find is they come and talk to me, 
and I do the math with them, and it helps them see what we're after. Uh, it's the kind of thing that's hard to do just by talking or coming up with arguments. You know, they, they should be allowed, though, to help their kid with math. I help my kid with math because I feel that there are gaps in the curriculum she's doing. You know, I have these workbooks that, uh, that I ordered away that are really great. Kids like them. I want to be involved in her education, and teachers should invite and encourage and support every parent in being involved in their children's education very actively. You know, maybe the parent only knows this or that about math. Let them work on that. They're not wrong to do that. You know, put them to work. We need all hands on deck, right? And um, with homework that might be more challenging, you know, I'll tell a story of when my elder daughter was in kindergarten. This was up in Vermont. I loved the way they did math there. In the classroom, there was a lot of good math talk. There was mathematical reasoning. There were the important manipulatives I thought used properly. On the wall were the properties of operations. Like, that was the only mathematical decoration in the room, the properties of operations. And I thought, this, I want my kid to go here. And so the math classroom had all these features that, that education needs to have, but they also had a workbook. And they had to do X pages a week. They were just expected to do it. It was a work ethic thing. It was a character thing. It was a skill development thing. And it was something I could help with. I could make sure she did her pages. I could help her with her pages. Because it wasn't rocket science stuff. You know, it was figurable. These were commodity workbooks, and they were fine. And so I think that parents deserve to be involved in their kids' curriculum. And it's a terrible feeling to feel that you have no control over this. It's a feeling I experience sometimes. Uh, and so I've invented my coping mechanisms, but I have a lot of resources that a lot of parents don't. So I think schools might be able to help with that. Uh, put the parents to work doing good, important work uh, and not turn this into an ideological war. curriculum developers are trying to take seriously the fact that we are in transition. And they say, you know what, what I'm coming out with now is not what I would necessarily come up with 10 years from now. I need a way to help people interpolate or transition. And so they're trying to build in techniques. So you might look when you're evaluating materials, are there techniques that help me deal with unfinished learning? Without what happens in textbooks today, you know, you can open up an Algebra 1 textbook and the first god-awful number of pages is all the way back to sixth grade material. And it's not indicated as such. You can't tell when you're finally getting to Algebra 1, right? And, and um, so we have, we have a problem that textbooks deal with this problem now by mere <laughs> review, mere recapitulation. So I would avoid mere recapitulation as much as possible. <clears throat> um, True differentiation and one-on-one -on -one help or, or all the ways people do um, differentiation, true differentiation, as I say, is an arrow in your quiver that you need. Um, but it can't crowd out grade-level content. There has to be some way for those kids to work with grade-level content, ideally in a way that addresses their gaps, not ignores them. So it's, it's only a, a banner right now. I don't, I don't have the book I can pull off the shelf that does that for you in fifth grade. Um, I do think... We're going to have to create this ourselves to some extent and, and lead the way. And again, the focus of the standards is actually meant to help with remediation, too. Think about that progress to algebra axis. You know, when we're talking about remediation or acceleration or whatever it is, this is the key axis to think about. So, you know, you don't go back and remediate 
stuff that's not major work or maybe even stuff that's not even core in this, you know. Mile wide inch deep is even worse for remediation than it is for students who are on grade level. <coughs> Makes the job infinite. Uh, yes. I do not. Integrated versus traditional math in high school. I, you know, um, the standards did not present courses. Um, you know, Appendix A was not part of the standards. It's, it was written by a different group. Many states have embraced it, uh, but that was a different group on a different project. The Common Core standards list the math and mathematical topics like functions and so on. You might say, well, why? You know, there were about a third of states that wanted traditional courses, about a third of states that wanted integrated courses, about a third of states that didn't want courses at all because they're strong local control states. And so in that situation, you know, the, the only solution is to just make high school about the math, which is what we did. I, I find <clears throat> the research on integrated versus traditional confusing. Certainly from a pure mathematical standpoint, it's a bizarre decision to interrupt Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 with a year of geometry. I mean, that's a strange mathematical and pedagogical choice, right? To, especially given how important algebra is to college and career readiness. So on the one hand, I'm sympathetic to integration. On the other hand, I think the old wave of integration was not so much an integration as a disintegration. Like, it moves everything together until you can't even see what you're doing. In high-performing countries, it's more like there's grade eight, nine, there's grade eight, grade nine, grade 10, where yes, there's some geometry, yes, there's some algebra, yes, there's some other things, but it's not so stirred up that you can't even see what color it is anymore. So that kind of model, you know, I think is more what people are thinking about now when they think about integration. But as logical as that sounds, and you know, it seems to work in other countries, we also have a teaching force that is trained on the old model, and so there are switching costs from going from traditional to integrated you know, I, I was asked once to give a, uh, a state said, give us a good standard, one standard in high school. We're going to film a teacher teaching this standard. And I, I won't go into all the presuppositions and quibbles you could make with that concept, but I sent him a standard. And it was the one uh, uh, from geometry, G, G, P, E, is it one or two, about uh, deriving the equation of a circle. Um, and I said, this would be great because you'll see how they do the geometry of the definition of a circle, how they relate that to the equation and what the equation is telling us and what it means for a point to lie on the graph of an equation. You know, it'll all be right there. <clears throat> and uh, I got the reply back, we can't do that when he's a geometry teacher. So it can't have algebra in it. So that's clearly suboptimal, but that's also the world we're in. So as policy, I don't have a recommendation on it. I think it's complicated. I, I would say that there are signals in the high school data that show that um, it would be a good idea if students' geometry courses, if they're on the traditional track, help them practice their algebra. You know, you could give geometric measurement problems with algebraic unknowns, right, and solve those. You can work with the equations of circles and other things as geometric objects, use coordinates. Um, I would whatever you call it or whatever you label it, have kids using their Algebra 1 in geometry a lot for the sake of their college career ready outcomes. Yeah? Out of curiosity, how did you become involved in writing a core and how did you get connected with the project? Out of curiosity. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. I am, um, you know, um, I was a professor of physics and mathematics at Bennington College. Before that, uh, I actually did a st startup company in education. I needed to make money for my parents. And uh, as I was finishing my PhD, I decided that doing a startup company in education would be better than going to work for a bank. And um, so I learned a lot about K-12 education, and particularly about standards. And, the, and uh, you know, as a physicist, mathematician, came to feel that they could improve a lot. But of course, you know, I was, um, building a company and taking the rules as they were given. So I did, and, and uh, that was successful. And then I went back to academia, really enjoyed being back in teaching, doing my research again. But I never really forgot about what I had learned. And um, you know, the Carnegie Commission <clears throat> had a, a, one of these blue ribbon commissions that comes along in education every so often. And they um, asked for an essay. 
And so um, my partner David Coleman and I wrote an essay for them that recommended four things that might help matters. Uh, people have forgotten mostly the other three, but one of them was about making standards fewer, clearer, and higher. And uh, you know, that essay you can see in the Carnegie Commission report. It attracted a lot of attention. The, the research that I did in preparing for it turned into more research uh, at some point. Um, I had a lot of knowledge <laughs> about other countries and what they did and states and what states did and what the research said on various questions. Uh, and clearly I had some interest in contributing to my country in this way because I allowed it to pull me further and further from my classroom to the, to the point where it finally pulled me out. Yes? How does special ed and ELL fit into these standards <coughs> from your perspective? Special ed and ELL. The, um, the standards movement generally has raised questions about special education, English language learners, special populations generally. Uh, and one good outcome of you know, a decade of standards-based education is that there are a lot of people now who work hard on this question and think hard on this question and have been able to apply what they know to the Common Core just as they had been doing before. So people like Judith Moshkovitz and other, and uh, Kenji uh, Hukuda, I think is his name, uh, he's on the literacy side, have, have worked on a lot of projects to um, make the standards real and important and valuable for those populations. If you look at the publisher's criteria uh, in math, we, we, one of the partner organizations on that was the Council of the Great City Schools. And dealing specifically with English language learner issues was of great importance to them. And I think you can see the imprint of that in the publisher's criteria. There are a number of specific points about English language learners. So I'll just give one example. Um, when you're trying to teach a math concept, there are virtues to showing different representations of it, like you know, a table or a graph or an equation or a verbal representation, but more to the point, identifying the correspondences between those representations. So you say, ah, look at this equation, it says 3s, and look in the words to the problem and it says three times as many things, right? So you're identifying a correspondence between the language and the equation, or, of course, you can identify the slope of three in a graph and say, see, we can see the three here. These networks of correspondences, much more than just kind of barfing out a bunch of representations because it's fun, identifying these correspondences uh, is, is, I believe, believed to actually be helpful for English language learners as well. It gives them a kind of a bootstrap uh, into the problem. So th some of the practices that are just good practices we wanted to emphasize are especially good for English language learners. And I don't want to sp speak above my level of expertise on this. There are a couple of references in the published criteria too. But also if you, if you want to follow up on <clears throat> that, um, the Council of the Great City Schools and Judith, Judith Moshkovitz uh, and Phil Darrow, my co-author, works a lot with that community. He would probably give, give more meaningful answers to that than I can. Yes, in the blue. You know, London model people are experimenting with it. I'm in favor of, of trying things out and seeing how they go. I don't, I don't have a view of it. I don't have direct experience of it. I don't know research on it. I can say that when I was <clears throat> um, a college professor, when I taught physics, once I had written a textbook, I finally had a textbook I trusted. So um, the students were very responsible for learning the material of that textbook, and then they would come into class and present it to the class. And then I would, watch, watching their presentations, I would diagnose misconceptions and unfinished learning. And then I would do the, the, the remaining hour of the lecture in response to that, which is a sort of a flipped thing in a way. I mean, it, that's with college kids, you know, who are paying to be there, who are, uh, you know, adult. And um, so I'm sure there are all kinds of issues that you can't transplant things. But I was, I'll say I'm sympathetic to the idea that Certain things should and could be 
uh, the student should have ownership over, and that as a teacher, as, as a kind of, as a teacher, my job is to get to the hard nut, the stuff that really, really, <clears throat> really requires that interaction. And, and you know, it's, it's again why we focus so much, because that's unavoidable. Okay, la last question. Doesn't even have to be about math. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, you know, um, what, to, what to say about the politics of this? Uh, I think there's a lot of proxy wars going on. People using the standards uh, as weapons in fights that are really about other things. And I feel best when I have my head down working with teachers like you guys on the real problem solving about implementation so that this vision of higher achievement can come through. So I have to deal with the politics. The politics are there, but uh, I do feel it's unfortunate. Thank you guys very much for these great questions, too. Thank you.